Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining today's session regarding the impact of incentives on data quality and participant engagement. Today's webinar is scheduled to run for one hour. While the session has been pre-recorded, please feel free to submit questions at any time and our team of experts will get back to you. All participants have been muted. A recording of this webinar will be sent to all attendees in the next few days. To get us started, I'd like to introduce Andrew Cannon. Andrew serves as Executive Director for Global Research Business Network. Andrew is passionate about participant engagement and exploring the role that national associations have to play in promoting and protecting the research industry. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks, Chris. My name is Andrew Cannon, Executive Director at GRBN, the Global Research Business Network. The GRBN is the Global Association for the Market Research Industry, bringing together over 45 national and regional associations. One of the key objectives of the GRBN is to increase the level of trust people have in the market research industry. And to do that, we know that we, we need to give them a better experience when they participate in market research. And one of the ways of giving them a good experience is through the incentives. So today, we're going to talk about the impact of incentives on both participant engagement and data quality. So today, we're going to present you findings of the research we conducted together with the University of Auckland in January to look into the aspect of the impact on incentives on both participant engagement and data quality. So during the webinar today, we're going to have a look at the questions and the methodology we used. What is the impact of the incentive on participant engagement, as well as the impact on data quality? and then get to wrap up with a few key takeaways. Before starting, I'd like to thank our partners, without whose help this research um, wouldn't have been possible, Echo Market Research, Innovate MR, and Tango Card. So thanks very much to those three companies for supporting us. And indeed, I'm excited to have experts from each of those three companies with me today talk through the results and share their expert insights onto the findings. So I'd like them now to introduce themselves. So Kerry, over to you. Hi, uh, my name is Kerry Hecht and I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Echo Market Research. We're an agency uh, based out of the US and our primary focus is on uh, recruiting uh, survey participants, qualitative participants, uh, and project management. Hi everyone, my name is Lisa Wilding Brown. I'm the Chief Research Officer here at Innovate MR. We are a global sampling and field services company uh, headquartered in Calabasas, California. I've been in the market research space for about 20 years and my specialties include panel management, quality and fraud mitigation, as well as incentivization and retention strategies around participants. Scotty? Thanks, Lisa. My name is Scotty Greenberg. I lead marketing at Tango Card. Uh, we make it easy for other companies to uh, either order or, you know, integrate and automate gift cards uh, to do incentivizing. Uh, we do this in a lot of industries, but um, market research is, is one of our biggest use cases, and we're always looking to find ways to help researchers engage, you know, their small groups up to up to their large uh, panels and communities. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Well, thanks, Kerry, Lisa, and Scotty. Great to have you, you all on board and for sharing your opinions today. So the key questions that we looked at when conducting the research was really we wanted to look at the impact of the incentives on both participant engagement and data quality under a different number of different scenarios. So firstly, we looked at what's the impact of doubling the incentive as opposed to say, for example, just giving them a greater user experience. And would it make a difference adding either a sweepstake or a charity donation element to the incentivization? We actually, when, when designing the survey, looked at also the difference at the source of recruitment. So whether participants came from a panel or from a social media source, and finally, we want to look at the impact of a short or a long questionnaire on both engagement, but also connected to the, the type of incentive 
and the amount of incentive because we were interested to see whether indeed the issue was more acute with relate in relation to longer surveys than shorter surveys. In terms of the research design that the University of Auckland put together, we ended up with 28 cells, um, with each cell having 100 participants matched on, on demographics. So that's a good representation. Uh, 16 of those cells came via panel, 12 via social media. And then basically for each cell, we looked at a different combination of incentive type and survey experience. Um, and also combining that with the length of the questionnaire. So, for example, one cell could have been a short normal experience questionnaire with a normal incentive served via the panel. And as you can see, by combining these different variables, we ended up with these, these 28 match cells um, for the analysis. So without further ado, um, let's look at the results that we got. Um, as I said, we're looking at two elements here. The first is participant experience. And then at the a later date during the webinar, we'll look at the impact of incentives on data quality. So the first thing we wanted to look at was the non-financial incentives. So what is the impact of giving a great experience over a normal experience to a participant? And as you can see from the graph, there is certainly an uplift um, in the proportion of people who would like to take another survey of this going up from 77. 82%, shall we show there was a definitely a, an impact to be seen there. But let's have a look how that compares on the same measure to actually doubling the incentive. So this chart shows just that. Um, and there's two sets of bars here. In the first set of bars, we're looking overall uh, within the panel environment. What is the impact of doubling the incentive? So if we double the incentive, we're actually going to increase participant engagement through this measure from 82 to 88%. And as you can see in the bars on the right, when we look at just the longer surveys, um, the 20 minute survey, um, there's a huge impact in increasing um, the incentive and doubling that incentive. So it definitely pays to do so um, in the longer survey experience. And why is that? Well, two of the measures that we looked at was around whether people found their participation to be valuable, or more specifically, whether they thought that the, the reward for their effort was fair. And as you can see on both of those measures, again, doubling the incentive really does increase on the perceived worth that the participant feels for participating in the research. If you look at the question of whether sweet stakes have a positive impact on the participant experience. Um, we wanted to look at that in both the panel environment and the social media environment. And I suppose the first thing that jumps out from the chart is the different level um, that we're going to get when we're looking at people um, who are used to taking surveys as opposed to people in the social media recruitment environment um, where they're not so used to taking a survey so frequently and and you can see here even with no incentive to adding a sweepstake incentive the level remains dramatically below that which it is for the panel experience where people are used to getting this so considering the survey very good um, amongst people who take surveys regularly and again we're seeing an uplift by actually giving um, a sweepstake or adding a sweepstake, which is good, um, showing obviously that this form of incentivization also has value to the research participant. And the final thing we looked at was the charity element. And again, what's interesting to be seen here is again the difference in level between the two groups. So we have the panel and the social media, and again, the panel showing a much higher likelihood to take another survey like this than would be those in the social media environment which is I think quite naturally and would be effective but again the important thing for us is that adding the charity um, increases the perception that the experience was good and therefore people would like to take 
take another experience. So I think at this point, it'd be good for the panel to jump in really and, and sort of have a think about this focus on, on I suppose, the non-financial incentive, i.e. giving the people a great experience rather than the so-called normal experience when they participate um, in research. So, so Kerry, I suppose you first, um, you know, do you think we should be focusing more on the, on the user experience um, and improving the participant engagement that way? And if so, how do you see the role of the data collector, the agency, um, and the end client in doing this? Thanks, Andrew. Um, I see the user experience as, as really the, the primary driver for um, uh, you know, uh, uh, people on our end being able to um, maintain panel health, attract new participants to panels, um, and then ultimately, you know, having data quality be impacted positively because of those two things. I mean, if we if we think about this logically from even our own perspectives with anything that we interact with, if we have a good experience, we're going to do it again. If we have a bad experience, we are less likely to do it again. Um, I think that that the the data collectors are probably the people that have the strongest opinions about this but also have the least amount of pull when it comes to being able to um, impact this, right? You know, by the time the, the survey or the screener gets to someone on my side of it or Innovate's side of it, it's been approved by, it's been written by the agency, it's been approved by the end client, and we have a very little, if any, ability to impact it at all. And, and I do think that that's sort of an unfortunate paradigm. You know, people on our side of, of the fence see um, hundreds, if not thousands, of different screeners from hundreds of different um, agencies with hundreds of different points of view and 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 whatnot. But yet, our um, you know whether we are considered to be experts on this topic is often overlooked, um, if not pooed entirely. So I think you know there hmm. we could uh, collaborate. With all three people in our companies in this you know in this area should be collaborating on this much earlier on in uh, the development of the research program, you know, whether it is um, at the point of sale or, you know, at the point of, of um, conceptualizing the research program. But I definitely think that, that there is a lot of room uh, for us to make improvements in this area, and it should be a collaborative effort. Lisa, what do you think about that? Yeah, I I totally agree with with that sentiment, Carrie. I mean, I think uh, you touched on a few things that I, I want to expand on. Um, you know, as someone who's who's worked both on the full service side, helping to design questionnaires, and then obviously on the sample side, uh, you know, I I think uh, I think everything you said there is spot on. I I think by the time uh, we get engaged as a sample provider, it's often too late to have an impact um, on the design of the survey which is definitely unfortunate. Um, I often can't really influence the design, but I can focus on the things that are within my control. So what's happening to the participant before they go into the client commission survey, and of course, what's happening when they're redirected back to us. So at Innovate, we're really, really focused on the participant experience that folks are having within our panel. Um, you know, it comes down to how transparent we're being in our communication, the type of style of, of conversational communication that we employ, I think, goes a long way. Um, we're also very focused on incentivizing not just when people qualify, but also when they don't qualify. So we're actually giving incentives to terminate experiences, which I think has been a game changer for us and something that I really didn't have the opportunity to do when I was working at previous, previous companies um, that maybe had more board control and influence through venture capital or, or publicly traded. Um, I think a lot of times companies out there that are managing their own panels will make very short-sighted decisions that have a real long-term consequence around panel retention. Um, and that's why you see there's just a lot of turnover in panel, very high attrition. And at Innovate, we've been really focused on trying to offset that because we recognize that's a massive pain point in the industry. So um, providing other opportunities for panelists outside of surveys, uh, whether it be promotional videos or contests, quick fun polls where everyone qualifies, those are all great strategies to really offset that attrition that, that most panel companies see. But I think really having a strong focus on 
user experience is, is critical. And we saw that in the data, right? Especially for the longer survey uh, where doubling the incentive had a, a pretty pronounced impact. Um, you know, and, and we call it the longer survey, but really it's a typical survey. When we looked at survey inventory across our thousands of clients and surveys, um, we saw that the average um, length of interview time was about 23 minutes. So I think as an industry, we need to take a really hard look at how we're engaging participants, um, making sure that we're editing and, and disciplining ourselves to um, only ask the most pertinent questions that are that are important for our research and really work hard to reduce the LOI, especially given the fact that so many um, so many folks are coming in through mobile devices where their tolerance level for longer surveys is definitely um, is definitely compromised. How about you, Scotty? Yeah, we I mean we as a company focus kind of all day every day on a, a good repeatable experience. Um, I think outside of the research industry, um, as we're looking at kind of the advent of uh, like advocate communities and like referral programs, um, these are really aimed at driving, you know, customers more than participants at to to do things that benefit a company, make a referral, do an online review, uh, give some feedback, and the main thing with with the experience there is uh, people want really, people expect that they're able to do a certain amount of things. So feeding them, you know, challenges or tasks on a regular basis, uh, making it really clear, uh, communicate really clearly what they stand to gain, whether it's, you know, some sort of intrinsic motivator, like, like getting a, a, like getting access to some, some preview information, or if it's, you know, gift cards and other incentives, uh, but making it really clear what they stand to gain and then providing them, uh, you know, enough challenges to keep them engaged. And then once they're engaged, really rewarding them well and quickly um, and making that experience really repeatable. Yeah, guys, I think that that's really great. I mean, I think one of the things people on the, the webinar could be asking, right, is, well, well, what is the difference between a normal and a great experience? What makes a great experience? And I know, you know, from our perspective, when we set this up, um, we were very clear, say, okay, if we want to give a great experience, uh, I think, Scott, as you said, you know, you need to be really clear on the purpose of the research, but not just from the client perspective, but really what is the meaning of this research for the clients? customers or clients and that's who at the end of the day the participant relates to right they're not doing it necessarily for coca-cola but they're doing it for coca-cola's clients people like themselves so i think that's one of the ways we can create a great experience i wonder if the panel has some other ideas you know um i know you all have participated in the work we did earlier um on creating a great experience so maybe you could share some thoughts on some other ways um, people listening to the webinar can think about creating great experiences for their participants. Kerry, what do you think? Yeah, so I think there are a lot of ways and it, it touches on what what Scotty was bringing up earlier about um, you know these intrinsic motivations. So one of the things that I find really interesting is we've got our, our hand in a lot of long-term communities or custom panels that are branded. And the way that we end up treating those participants is quite different when um, there is, you know, the client's name is exposed. So we do things, we do a lot of, of engagement content, whether it's through um, newsletters that we send out to the panelists or information that is shared on, you know, a website. Um, we create feedback loops um, that share, um, you know, what we're using the data for and, and, you know, to the extent that we can share that back, what the results of the, of the data are. Um, we can do things like incorporating a lot of video and, and things like that. Now, I get that that isn't all necessarily relevant for a one-off survey, but if we're thinking about things in, in um, holistically and we're thinking about things in the long term, right, that the impact on creating this engagement content in a more engaging experience um, really has lots of benefits. I mean, and again, we see this in custom channels where often the, the um, dollar amounts for incentives are really quite low. And the way that we keep people informed and engaged is, is just different because we have to, otherwise it would be too cost prohibitive. 
So I think we can take lessons right. from that. And, you know, taking lessons again from some of the things that um, Tango Card is doing for um, rewards that are outside of market research, right? That you've got these people that belong mm -hmm. to, you know, a group and they're engaging them in a different way. And often those things really don't cost us any money. They do cost us some time, but they don't cost us, you know, a solid dollar amount of increased incentives or things like that. So, um, you know, we've seen from previous work as well that incorporating things like um, video and graphics and things like that within surveys, you know, changes the perception that people have of how long it's taking them to complete, right? And they'll, mm -hmm. if you just have a, a sort of a, a straight survey and maybe it's not mobile optimized or that kind of thing, they'll feel like it's much longer than it actually is. And if you start rolling in things that are perhaps a little bit unexpected or informative or things like that, their perception of what's happening um, is better. Right. So I think that there's, I think there's a lot of meat there. And, and yeah, and really the point of, again, about just being, if it's branded, we behave differently. And I think that that is, you know, one of those things we should sort of take a look at. Right, definitely. Lisa, can you add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm thinking back to the research on Research Andrew that we all did um, a couple of years ago with the GRBN, and we we looked at video and the influence of video, and we saw a 20% uptick in participants' likelihood to participate again in the future, which I thought was really incredible. And it was a, a quick and dirty 30-second video um, that the, the client put together, uh, and when we looked at it side by side. You know, for those participants that didn't see the video versus those that did, um, we definitely saw a really marked improvement. And I think it goes to sort of what Carrie was just saying, where we have a tendency, I think, as an industry to just think about the study or the project in front of us. And we really need to think about the larger sample universe that we're all trying to project to. And what can we do as, as good stewards to, to the process um, that not only have a positive impact to the study at hand, but also to the, the entire universe and the industry as a whole. Um, so, you know, doing things like video um, are, are really very impactful. Newsletters, you know, thinking about how social media outreach can be leveraged with panel communities is also another piece that, that we do quite a bit of work on. So, you know, recognizing that we're not just interacting with our panelists when they're logged into our panel environment, but they're engaging with us on, on other channels like social media and Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, to really, you know, create a more holistic approach around that that relationship and and i think you know it's really about focusing on making it a, a two-way relationship uh versus this kind of transactional um uh situation where we're just asking so much of participants and not really giving back so you know like carrie mentioned using data of course that's not proprietary in nature to help uh, participants see how they compare to the wider population that's participated in the survey is also another a great way. And, and I recognize that a lot of clients are reticent to share data, but there's definitely opportunity. I know with GRBN, we've collected that data in the past on a wide multitude of topics that you can all leverage and share within your survey environment if you're if you're concerned about sharing things that might be proprietary in nature. So there's, there's, a, there's a bit of extra work, I think, that's involved um, from our end as a, as a community, but it really goes a long way. And it's about changing, you know, the, 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 the kind of perspective that you have. Um, and then other things, simple things like, you know, having a really good help desk mechanism in place where you're reviewing tickets that come in and you're responding in a very timely fashion. So closing those tickets within a 24 hour period, for example, uh, making sure that, um, you know, participants get heard and understand if there's an issue or whether it's a technical problem in the survey um, or they have just questions about the survey that someone's getting back in touch with them. And then I think really focusing on the design of the survey itself. So grids are great from a computational standpoint. They make the back-end analysis really easy um, and help to streamline that for researchers, but that's not always the best approach or presentation um, to show panelists and, and survey participants. So it makes sense to really step back and think about the design of the survey, find ways to refine it so that it is um, it's, it's better for participants, I think is, is something that we all need to do a better job in. And, and it starts with having oh. conversations like this and being really cognizant of it um, and, okay. and, and stepping up for it. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Lisa and Kerry, a lot of stuff there. Scotty, do you want to add anything at this stage or save your thoughts to the next part when we're gonna talk about the, the value of the incentive? 
Just just one extra thing. Um, I think that the work Carrie's doing with with building her communities and and Lisa's spot on with with you know kind of thinking holistically about how we are engaging people. Um, you got you have to you know if you think about the measures we're using in this study, like uh, we're talking about taking another survey, but we're also talking about feeling like the like the the incentive was fair. And we're also talking about, you know, did they feel like they were giving value? Um, it kind of, you know, if you think about the incentive experience paired with the survey experience, um, sometimes it will be a little bit more transactional when you're just getting one project done quickly. Uh, but if you are building out these communities, having multiple methods of, of communication, having a fair incentive, but also, you know, showing the people how they're helping you bring value uh, is, is big. And so communication is key there, uh, setting expectations, but also, you know, giving them, uh, you know, what was this all for type of message. Um, and that'll go a long way to engage a lot of people more than just an incentive. Fantastic. Well, a lot of great tips there. Um, I think if you're on the webinar today, you'll be pleased to know that the GRDN is updating its Engage Handbook. Um, we boiled it down to, to 30 key tips um, that we're going to give you to improve the participant experience. Uh, and that should be out um, in April. Um, at least I presume there's no, no problem giving everybody on the, on the call a copy um, or access to that handbook when it's out. So they can look at the bits of advice that you're given today um, also in that handbook version and use it in their daily work. So moving on. I think I'd also now like to look at when well, we looked at the impact of the incentive on participant experience, but let's see how it's impacting data quality itself. Now, obviously, there are a lot of measures for data quality, and for the purpose of this survey, um, we took a joint measure of inattentive responding to the questions, so basically using two measures here, a combination of inconsistency and in frequency. So, so basically saying that either, you know, people answer differently at the beginning of the survey and at the end of the survey to similar type questions, or they answer multiple times illogically um, to what you would expect. So these are the measures we looked at in the data through these two data quality measures that the University of Auckland again put into the survey um, based on the literature around how you can use inattentive responding as a surrogate measure for data quality. So that's what we did here. And I'm going to take you through some of the key findings about how changing the incentive impacted um, this attentiveness or data quality surrogate measure. So again, perhaps you're not surprised, but in line with the participant experience, having a shorter questionnaire um, definitely led to more acceptable data quality than the longer questionnaire. So roughly six to seven percent more likely um, to have that acceptable data quality if the questionnaire was shorter. So that's fine overall. But if we dig down into that finding a little bit, we actually find that this is very much true within the, the longer survey experience that you had the great survey experience was actually helping data quality much more within the longer survey. So again, it's in line with what we saw participant engagement. If we are having a longer survey, then you better have a great experience if you want to get good quality data. We also found there was a correlation with income here. So Definitely having this great survey experience helped you get better data quality from more wealthy participants. And finally, if you added the, the sweepstakes or the charity donation, you were also then more likely to improve the data quality than if you offered no incentive um, within the social media recruitment experience. So, so definitely some improvements to data quality can be found when a great experience works best. So if we look at doubling the incentive, um, 
we found that there's a 4% increase in the amount of acceptable data quality we're getting over a normal incentive in the survey. So an increase, again, although not necessarily huge, it's still, I think, significant. So we found that doubling the incentive worked well within a, a normal survey experience. So if you offered a great survey experience, you wouldn't necessarily need to double the incentive, but that's, that's only a marginal increase. What we did find that doubling the incentive became really important or more important when you were looking to engage younger people. So 18 to 34 year olds in this case, there's definitely um, an improvement in data quality. So this group with a normal experience survey, again, stress that um, when you double the incentive. And when we looked at the long survey experience, um, we definitely saw in particular amongst males, um, when they were taking a longer survey, you really needed to have this doubled incentive um, in order to get um, higher data quality out of these participants. So at this point, I'd like to pause again um, and sort of come back to my panel and, and talk a bit about, in particular, the financial incentives um, and what we should be, you know, paying participants. And and I suppose the the key question is, you know, should we as an industry you know, be paying participants or, or respondents more than we're doing today. Um, and if we, if so, if that's so, you know, why aren't we doing so? Um, be a couple of the key questions I think the audience could be interested in. So, so maybe Scotty, you can kick us up on this one. Um, should we be paying more? Sure. Um, I think uh, focusing on what maybe. You know, one of the my favorite questions in the study was asking people if they thought the incentive was fair. Um, there's an interesting balance between, you know, with a double incentive, 90% of people said they'd take the survey again, but still only 45% thought it was fair. Um, so I don't I don't necessarily know what accounts for that huge gap, but my guess is that there's a we're approaching a, a good balance with with this study of figuring out what will engage people multiple times versus what their perception of a fair incentive is. Um, so what that tells me is that there's definitely room for, for larger incentives here. Um, but if we want to think purely from a business perspective, um, it might not be, be necessary. But I think uh, going back to, you know, being a good steward uh, for research and for engaging you know, more and more diverse people over time. I think doubling the incentive uh, to raise that, you know, to raise the percentage of people that think a incentive is fair is is a good idea. Um, and then also, you know, as an incentive provider, uh, we're we're also stuck where we would love larger and larger incentives, but um, but for us and our business and the overall health of our programs that we that we take care of. Uh, we just want people to figure out the right incentive to engage, you know, a number of people over time, because uh, that's what's going to drive the best results from any program, research, uh, marketing, health and wellness, et cetera. Uh, a good incentive that matches, you know, people's opportunity cost uh, and makes them feel like it was fair. Um, mm, excellent. Yeah, Carrie, I don't know what your experience with incentives are in some of these new communities your building, but I think uh, you'd agree that finding a, a good balance there is important. Yeah, so we we kind of, you know, as, as a company come at this from a couple of different angles, right? So we do a lot of qualitative research where the model is quite different, right? So we have screening surveys that people go through and they could be anywhere from um, you know, five minutes to 45 minutes, and I think that we would all, we could all argue that some of them are a good experience and some of them are a pretty terrible experience. Um, and, and we don't incentivize for that, right? And we do, you know, are able to measure drop-off and things like that. Um, but the ultimate reward for qualitative participants is much greater, right? So they're, you're looking at paying them, you know, 50 to to $100 plus an hour for their time. 
Um, and I think that, that, you know, you see a different kind of person that's interested in participating um, in, in that kind of research frequently for, for good and for bad, right? So I think that there's, there's you know, that, that, that changes the way that I think about this a little bit. So getting into um, an alternative to panel was a, um, something that came later for us as an organization. So we were a little bit surprised by um, paying everybody for um, a survey, whether it was a terminate or not, but then we were you know, equally as surprised by the low amount that one would get paid ultimately for completing the survey. You know, you're looking at, 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 at pennies for their time over the course of an hour. Philosophically, I feel like most people on this call probably do that we should be, the people should be engaging because they're enjoying the process. They like what they're doing, um, and, and, you know, because they want to give their opinions, but we know that that isn't, you know, a perfect scenario, especially if we're not going to be focused on the quality of the experience. So I was also intrigued, Scotty, by the, the notion of fairness when it came to this. And I think that it's an interesting thing to, to think about because we don't typically ask them that question, right? So they may feel happy to have gotten their dollar or five dollars or whatever. But if they're walking away with an internal feeling of this wasn't fair, you know, that's going to have a cumulative effect on that individual participant, which is going to have a cumulative effect on um, panel health. Now, to go back to your, your comment about the communities that we're doing, yeah, I mean, it goes back uh, for us because, again, if you're engaging with, you know, 2,000 people over the course of a year on a topic, you know, you're, and the client always asks, what should we incentivize them? Even if you're talking about giving them a base incentive of something like $25 a month, the cost, it's just cost prohibitive, right? So we really, we think about incentives on a, a, the basis of an individual activity that we're going to ask them to do. And then again, we focus our time and, and much more time than you would in, in these other cases on creating a community feel and that experience and the feedback loop and everything I mentioned before. So, you know, the, the conversation about fair incentives kind of goes out the window when you're looking at long-term custom panels or long-term custom communities because it just, you, it, you know, no one's got that kind of money. Lisa, what do you think about this? Yeah, I think that's a good point, Carrie. I mean, we have to be, we have to be reasonable, right? I mean, if we think about uh, the average cost per interview, the average CPI in our space, um, there's been quite a bit of compression through the years. It's not really increasing, it's decreasing. Um, and that leaves very little left over once you factor in all the overhead costs to procuring and managing that, that sample process through, through the survey, hiring staff, uh, managing a panel environment if, if, if it is in fact a panel. Um, and so that's, that's really why you see um, you know, very low incentives going out to to participants in in the space. And so I think the first part is to really have that dialogue so that there's transparency, so that clients that are are procuring sample from from different agencies understand that when you are paying a dollar twenty five CPI, there's very little left over for that participant. And there's all sorts of uh, impact that that is a consequence to that. Uh, I don't know that there's enough conversation in our industry uh, that's that's happening about what those trade-offs are that that we're making because of these you know severely low CPIs. So I think that's that's one piece, and I think the other piece is really talking about representation. And we saw that from the data in terms of younger populations, males specifically, needing to double that incentive to engage them. Uh, I think that's that paints a really strong picture that if if our goal is to have a representative sample, a representative audience that embodies all the different demos uh, that we're looking to to reach, that we really have to take a hard line on incentivization. So the short answer for me and our team is that yes, we do need to pay pay more to participants, but we also need to have, I think, greater transparency in the industry, more conversation and dialogue around what are some of those trade-offs and how it impacts data quality and overall participant engagement. Um, and then also, you know, staying realistic and recognizing that there are limited budgets that companies are working with. And so what can we do to offset 
um, that that incentive and that that limited budget. There are definitely things that we can do to focus on, for example, user experience um, and and making our surveys a bit more palatable for participants, so that we're not generating high drop off rates, uh, as an example. So. There's, there's so many different factors and different variables that are having an influence. I think if you look at the industry as a whole, our conversion rate is sub 10%. So that basically means that nine out of 10 times people are not having a qualifying or positive experience from their perspective. And that's many times a function of just the low incidence populations that um, our clients are looking to reach. So when it comes to a panel community, sure, we're trying to get as feasible as possible, and we can do that through profiling, trying to understand what makes participants tick, trying to serve up opportunities that are more relevant to them, whether because they're gonna qualify or they're more an interesting topic area. Um, so really trying to focus on increasing conversion, increasing the likelihood of a positive experience so that they do qualify and earn the incentive. Um, there's just so many factors that, that are at play here. I don't think that, that one sits in isolation to the others. I think it's really about opening up a bigger conversation around what we're doing as an industry to improve the overall experience for participants. Yeah, and I think you all knocked on a good point around the transparency and, and, and the fairness. And I suppose that, you know, if you're transparent about who the survey's for, you know, at the end of the survey, for example, um, you know, this question of fairness becomes more important to the to the end client um, as, you know, they start to consider surveys um, as more of a brand touch point and how we treat customers and potential customers comes into play um, in that respect. Uh, if they know, you know, the amount of incentive, they can judge themselves whether they think that's a fair way to treat their customers or not. So let's hold that thought and let's move on just a, a short space and look at the role of um, sweepstakes and, and charity on the data quality aspect. So we found that the sweepstakes worked really well in that, that great survey experience, whereas you know we saw that the direct financial um, doubling the incentive worked well for that normal survey. Actually within the the great survey experience world, then, then sweepstakes were a good um, form and incentive. And, and we found that sweepstakes were particularly appealing um, to males taking shorter surveys where perhaps, you know, that financial incentive is, is, is really low um, for one person, but um, the chance of, of winning a, a sweepstake of some value um, became a better financial incentive um, for the males in that environment. Whereas in contrast, when we looked at, at charity donations, we found again that they worked well with shorter surveys. Uh, but there was more females again taking these shorter surveys um, that in particular found charity donations um, to be of appeal. So a couple of interesting findings there. So maybe Lisa, if you want to kick off on, on this one with what are your thoughts about using sweepstakes and charity donations uh, and how can we optimize their use when used? Yeah, I mean, I think just from my experience, um, you know, sweepstakes and charity donations are great um, in combination with other incentives. I have seen on many occasions in the past where clients, again, are dealing with a limited budget and so they forgo the direct incentive or the per respondent incentive and opt to do a sweepstakes where there might be one out of several thousands that participate that would actually win the reward. And in those cases, it's just, it's not motivating enough. So I think it's great as a, as a combination effort um, to have a multi-pronged incentive practice, but you know, opting to do just a sweepstakes where the perception of opportunity is, is very low, really deters people from participating. Uh, and I think the other piece related to charity, I mean, it's great to see sort of these altruistic approaches to giving back to the community, especially among younger demos. Um, that millennials um, in particular definitely have this social good um, that, that I think is very central to the fabric of, of that generation. Um, so again, I think it's about a multi-pronged approach versus, you know, just opting for a sweepstakes because of a limited budget. I think that that, you know, has been shown to have, to result in a lower response rate. So I just kind of point that out, Andrew. I think that's a, a worthy to, to point out here. How about you, Carrie? What are your thoughts? 
So we, because we recruit primarily from social media, <clears throat> I think our experience is a little bit different. Um, we, we, you know, when, when we have tried to do surveys where we give a very small incentive um, to people for completing, it doesn't make sense for our model. Um, because we're not keeping them in a database and there's no opportunity for them to um, accumulate points, right? So it's not that they can get, you know, a, a dollar here and a dollar there, five dollars here, five dollars there, and then ultimately cash them out for some larger amount of money. So the sweet stakes model is one that we have been using um, quite successfully, uh, you know, since we've really gotten into, into uh, uh, sample sizes that are large enough for surveys and communities and things like that. So that does work for us. Um, I feel like the, the the charity, which we've played with a little bit, has, um, I guess, not terribly surprisingly, not been particularly effective. I mean, I wish it were, right? I mean, I guess we probably all wish it were. But that hasn't worked very well for us. Um, but yeah, the sweet stake is, is primarily what we would do. Right, but Perry, is that then? And usually, when we do, do that, like a one in a million chance of winning something, you tend to do it that it's a reasonable no. amount of money for a reasonable probability. Is that right? Yeah. So what we will usually do is um, up to three fifty-dollar gift cards for every one hundred people, and so that gives mm. it, you know, it, it feels like something that is still attainable, and that's that is pretty much our model, depending upon. Um, you know what the kind, what kind of people it is that we're looking to engage with. Yeah, just I'd be interested in hearing in Scotty if you see sweet steaks. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna expand on that. I mean, I think we're dealing with two different environments on our side, right? We're talking about panel from from Innovate side and Carrie, you're talking about totally. Uh, the social media intercept. So I think that's important to know. And I love your recommendation around um, perception, right? Having multiple winners. Uh, with, a, with a lower cash value that seems reasonable and reachable um, are all really great kind of best practices around sweepstakes. So before I, I cut off on Scotty there, but I just wanted to point that out. Um, what are your thoughts, Scotty? Uh, it, I mean, it really comes down to people's perception of you know the value they might get out of it. Um, we run a lot of programs that do include charities and, and um, uh, we do, uh, there is a large redemption for charities in a lot of our programs, uh, but there's also a, a, a feeling of goodwill that, that they're even there to begin with. Uh, so there's, a, there's definitely a benefit we see there. Um, and then there's a lot of different ways to set up a sweepstakes, but I think carries on to something in that, you know, let's say you have a thousand dollars and you, and you want to give out $1,000 cards versus one $1,000 card. I think people's perception is that they're they're going to have a better chance at, at winning that, and so it's ultimately going to feel more valuable or um, you know more motivating. Uh, Lisa used motivation before um, to kind of get them in and take that uh, survey or take that action. Yeah, excellent. I mean, there's obviously a point around sweepstakes uh, and the law. Um, there's a lot of state laws out there. They are fairly similar but I think if you do organize sweepstakes you need to be obviously aware um, of the legal requirements and obviously you know the people on the call here the experts um, can certainly help you um, navigate those those legal waters so just to wrap up um, you know I think from the research we basically end up with a few key takeaways um, firstly not surprisingly short is better than long and, and, and short here we really defined it as 10 minutes or less um, as something that, that people would consider reasonable in terms of time usage as Lisa pointed out um, the average um, can tend to be much higher than that at present so we've got a lot of work as an industry to do to get shorter um, definitely a great experience um, improves the perception of the survey and how it actually works in terms of delivering data quality and as we mentioned you know there's a lot of good practice um, information available um, either directly through the companies um, and their experts on the course today or through the handbook that we're going to issue um, in the middle of next month and improving the incentive does indeed have 
a impact on both participant experience and data quality. And I think it's a case of working out what is best for the, the type of survey, what is best, is it a one-off engagement, is it a more community type approach to decide, well, is it just a, a financial incentive or a direct financial incentive or a sweepstake and charity element worthwhile including. But I think it's, as an industry, you know, I think we need to think long and hard about how we are incentivizing the people who participate um, in research as they are indeed the lifeblood that we, we all rely on um, for the success of the industry, but also that of our clients. Um, so really, I'd like to ask the panel um, just to wrap up a little bit on this with their, their final thoughts. And in particular, I suppose I'm interested to, to hear, did anything surprise you? in the results that we presented, or was it all as expected? Um, should we do any further research um, off the back of this? And are there any final things you, you'd like the audience um, to hear? So maybe Kerry, uh, if you could kick off with this one. Sure. Um, I'm always a fan of doing more research on this stuff. I think um, I, I would say that some of the numbers were a little surprising and that I, I would have expected some bigger jump. Um, but I think that, that, you know, if we can move forward, um, get more people from different areas of our industry involved, especially in doing more work around the participant experience, right? How are we defining a good experience? What happens if we do this? What happens if we do that? That's something that I would love to be a part of and love to see um, more people in our industry get on board with. Um, you know, we've been banging on this drum for a while now, and I think it's it's an incredibly worthwhile cause and something that um, we as a company and, and myself as an individual are really passionate about. So thanks for the opportunity to be a part of this and we look forward to the next one. Excellent. Thanks. Buddy? Thanks, Kerry. Thanks obviously, for all your work and support on this. And it's been a pleasure working with you. And obviously, um, yeah, I think the, there's a lot of work still to be done in the future as well. So, Scotty, what do you think? I think this illuminated some some it, not necessarily a surprise to me, but it, it it put some some good numbers around the fact that if you double the incentive, uh, you're going to get you know more engagement, better data quality. If you improve the experience, you're going to get a little bit more engagement, better data quality, um, and that's the I mean that's the approach we bring to the table uh, is we. You know, we focus really hard on the incentive experience. Um, so uh, it's kind of our duty in the industry to to make sure that um, while all the researchers are focusing really hard on on engaging people more and better, um, and hopefully, you know, paying them uh, fairly. Uh, I think this is a great trend. It's definitely a trend we see. Uh, you know, for instance, in the marketing space, people. Uh, paying very well for referrals and and testimonials and stuff like that, um, and then we we promise to kind of to not let the experience fall off uh, when there's an when there's an incentive involved. Um, we want that experience to uh, be consistent and and bring people back into the panel or or to a company to take another survey because they had a good experience uh, end to end. Excellent, fantastic, Lisa. Yeah, I think uh, I would agree with Carrie. I was expecting um, more of a significant impact on on some of the data, um, but I don't think that that necessarily tells a bad story. I think participant experience and incentivization are, are critical elements to not only the study at hand, but the, the wider universe that we're all trying to to represent. And that really is that's really what we're all in here for, right? It's about representation and making sure that you reach all the audiences that you're you're looking to to understand, uh, so that you can deliver better uh, better insights to your clients that are impactful, that are going to drive key business decision decisions. And so, um, you know, I'm always an advocate for for doing more research on research. Andrew, we've been we've been collaborating for several years now, and it's 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 been a wonderful experience for for the team and I here at Innovate. So we're we're always ready and willing to jump in and and do more research. Um, I, it would be very interesting to look at other geographies, 
um, take a deeper dive on some of the nuance across generations and, and the different demographics, understanding kind of the psychographic component as well. You know, we all balance sample by demographics, but obviously understanding the key psychographic um, differences that exist among the populations uh, is also uh, just as important from my perspective. Uh, but I think too, it all comes down to greater transparency, more dialogue, reaching to different different uh, stakeholders within the industry and recognizing that we all operate in this, this ecosystem. And depending where you sit in the ecosystem, you may or may not have significant influence. But I think participating in opportunities like this really give us an opportunity to voice our perspective um, and hopefully move the industry forward for years to come. And, and thank you so much for, for involving us. It's been, it's been a real great experience. Well, thank you. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, from my perspective, I think what we've learned is that everybody does have a role, um, even if it's just a small role, right? It's each project counts. Um, each, each experience adds to the totality. So even, you know, every researcher, when they're thinking about their projects and how they're going to incentivize and what type of experience, that is so important. It's not just what we do here at the industry body level, but how that translates on a daily pr basis into how we as an industry interact with the people, as I mentioned earlier, that we really do need to maintain engaged and, and willing to participate and paying them a fair incentive and giving them a great experience are two ways that we definitely need to do that. So I'd like to thank, you know, Kerry, Lisa and Scotty um, once again, not only for your participation today, but also for the support you've shown, not only on this this project, but over the years. And I'd like to thank the audience for taking the time to listen to us today. And as Lisa said, you know, if anybody does want to get involved, um, we're more than welcome to have that conversation and find out how we can all work together to improve the experience we're giving participants. So, so thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.